Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Welcome everyone this morning to our harvest service. And I would like to give you all a special welcome, whether you're part of the furniture here at McQuiston, you're a visitor, or a bit later if you're watching us through all our means, I give you all a warm welcome and pray that you would feel the Holy Spirit among us this morning. The psalmist says, you care for the land and water it. You enrich it abundantly. The streams of God are filled with water to provide the people with grain. For so you have adorned it. We are going to praise God now with our first hymn, Come, you thankful people, come. just like to give thanks for those who give up their time to come and put the harvest 
uh, together here at the front. Thank you very much. We're going to bow our heads in prayer now. Uh, but I think we'll just have a, just a few moments to pray, uh, to, to pray in silence. And just to pray for whatever the Lord puts into your heart. Father in heaven, we give thanks this morning that you have brought us all here safely and with willing hearts in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, so that we can worship you as one people under the power of the cross and the Holy Spirit. Lord, we thank you that you love us so much that you sent your one and only Son to die for us for us, so that everyone who believes in his life, death, and resurrection will see his glory forever. Lord, we thank you for all the blessings you have given us and for the plentiful harvest you have provided. What a wonderful, wonderful example of how fruitful life can be when we live it with you in our hearts. Father, help us to stay focused on you this morning, and we ask that you cleanse us of our discretions so that our hearts may give their unavoid attention to you. Father, we pray that all of us sinners here today would be able to walk close to you and that you would guide us spiritually. We ask that you help us to understand and learn from the sermon during our time here, and that much like the harvest, our relationship with you would grow and be bountiful. Father, we pray these things in your holy name as we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thine kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And the kingdom, the power, and the glory, death and ever. Amen. Our reading this morning is taken from the book of John, uh, chapter 4, 27 to 42. The disciples rejoined Jesus. And I can't see this. <laughs> I'll have to hold it up, sorry. <laughs> Just then, his disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with a woman. But no one asked, What do you want? Or why are you talking with her? Then, leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, Come, see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? They came out of the town and made their way toward him. Meanwhile, his disciples urged him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food, food to eat that you know nothing about. Then his disciples said, said to each other, 
Could someone have brought him food? My food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Don't you have a saying? It's still four months until harvest. I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. Even now, the one who reaps draws a wage and harvests a crop for eternal life, so that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. Just the same, one sows and another reaps is true. I sent you to reap what you have not worked for. Others have done the hard work and you have reaped the benefits of their labor. Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them. And he stayed two days. And because of his words, many more became believers. They said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this man really is the saviour of the world. Amen. And the Reverend Beggs is going to come now and speak. Thank you, Ken, and uh, thanks for leading the, the service um, to this point. Also, to add my thanks um, to Ken's for the, to those um, who put together um, the display here at the front and outside as well. Thanks for all your hard work. Um, now, boys and girls, um, I'm not going to ask you to come up this morning, but maybe just to think for a wee moment, because we're going to see a video in a moment or two, and uh, this video. Um, is a younger person talking to the moderator of our church, and that's the, um, I don't know how to describe the moderator to you, it's a, he's a minister who is like, um, he represents the church, I suppose is the best way to put it. But anyway, um, he's talking to this girl who's studying the environment. Now we're fortunate this morning and uh, to have all this around us, um, representing what God has given to us. And uh, we remember that God gave us the good earth and whenever God had finished making everything, he said that it was good. And he said to people that you've got to look after the world, you've got to be fruitful, you've got to multiply, make new people um, and also subdue the earth and fill it. And God gave us the world as our resource. He gave it to us as our home. But like any home, we're supposed to care for the world. Now, of course, we know at the moment that that's not the case, that uh, we've uh, got climate crisis and there's flooding in some places and uh, whirlwinds in other places and storms and all those sorts of things that scientists tell us is because we haven't cared for the world and we haven't looked after. And we create something called carbon whenever we drive in our cars or fly in planes or light fires or power stations, whatever it is, and that that is disrupting the whole climate of the world. So we've got to be careful about what we do. And we're going to see a video now. Um, as I said, this is the moderator, um, David Bruce, speaking to a, a younger girl who's a student, and she's from uh, Bloomfield Congregation, which is just down the road. And they're chatting about climate and what we can do to care for the world. Why do you think churches should be caring about these issues? So if you think of what the Bible says about the environment, things like um, in way back in the earliest chapters of Genesis, in Genesis chapter 1, I think it's verse 28, it, it talks there about filling the earth and subduing it. Now some might interpret that word subdue in a negative way and say, well, actually, it's our job to exploit these resources uh, for our own ends. And of course, there is a sense in which that's true. The resources of the earth have been given to us to use, but not to exploit. 
not selfishly to abuse, but rather to creatively use, both to the glory of God and to the help of humanity. And statements like filling the earth and subdue it need, I think, to be read alongside um, statements like um, in Psalm 24, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. So he loves it, he cares for it. We are his, but so are the plants and the animals, the flora and the fauna, just as the physical world that we inhabit is his and he takes glory from it. So let me take you back to those geography lessons when this was first mentioned. Was that the trigger that got you started in your own concerns or was there something else? I got really engaged with it whenever I went to uh, Summer Madness, which is a Christian festival that usually happens in the summer um, in Northern Ireland. And Summer Madness usually have Tear Fund take one of their tents and Tear Fund do a few seminars and um, that type of thing. And I remember going to uh, all the Tear Fund seminars that I could and they talked about climate change and how it was unfairly impacting um, people living in different parts of the world. They were specifically talking about Malawi at the time and how through climate change, their seasons were changing. They'd been subject to flooding and then drought and how for sustenance farmers, that was really affecting them um, in a huge way. And they were talking about how God is a God of justice and just how, as we're called to love other people, we're called to love our global neighbors um, so our actions and our words need to line up whenever we're saying we love our brother and sister across the world. What is um, your message to the church? Well, I think my message to the church is think bigger than we have been. Um, think bigger than we have been when we pray and when we decide. Um, the gospel of redemption deals not only with our sins. Now, wonderfully, it deals with our sins. It takes our sins away so that they're never held against us again because Jesus has died in our place. And in addition to that, and as, as part of the absorption of our sins, the effects of our sins are also absorbed so that this groaning creation is going to be redeemed and repaired and handed back as a new creation. Now, if we as a church can align ourselves with that extravagant act of love, that, that, that extraordinary narrative of repair, by saying we are going to be a people who anticipate that by adjusting our lifestyles and our ambitions and our behaviors to suit that wonderful expectation of a new heaven and a new earth, that would be good. So uh, Olivia, as COP26 approaches, obviously there's going to be a uh, growing interest uh, in this and we'll be wanting to pray as a church as, as this approaches. How can we do that? Give us some guidance about how to pray in light of the environmental crisis and, and COP26. Yeah, so praying for the leaders that are going to be at that climate conference, um, that they'll really engage with what's being shared and really want to make change when they get there. Um, secondly, that it won't be um, just a lot of uh, kind of words and we hope to do this by this year and setting some far off distant target. Targets are really useful, um, but sometimes they just remain targets and nothing is actually done. So praying for action um, from what's come out of the conference, that'll be actually surprisingly uh, a lot of action would be lovely. Um, and also praying for countries like ourselves who are particularly wealthy in comparison with some others, um, that they'll so show grace to poorer countries um, and that where they can make changes um, because they have the finances and the resources where some other countries won't be able to yet, um, that they'll do that and they'll use that opportunity to kind of take the load off um, countries that maybe can't make action in such um, vast quantities as of yet. Um, yeah, and just show grace in that. Okay. Thank you. Now, boys and girls, that's all important. It's important that we look after the world that God gave us, the home that he gave us. And uh, that's not just for you to think about. That's for us all to think about. All the big people, all the grannies and grandas, the mums and dads, 
who are here today as well. Um, because when we've gone to be with Jesus, the world will be yours to look after. And so it's probably best if you start now to think about these things. So before you go out with Kerry to m M&M and Kids, um, and before we sing, we're going to pray just for a moment or two. Let's pray. Our Lord and our Father, we thank you that you've given us this beautiful world as our home. But we know, Lord, we're, we're very conscious. We know that we haven't always treated the world as we should do, that we've uh, been lazy and we've polluted things as a human race. We've uh, exploited the world. We've taken and we haven't given back. So we ask today that you would help us to think about these things, whether we're boys and girls or whether we're older people. Help us to think about what we can do to care for the world as you commanded us to do. And Lord, whatever we can do, help us to do that. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now we're going to sing a song, It Takes an Almighty Hand. And after this, boys and girls, you can go out to m M&M and Kids with Kerry.
Well, the announcements are printed in the bulletin, which is available at the front and back doors. And if you haven't picked a copy up, um, please do that. As always, there are prayer points in the back, which we encourage you to use uh, through the course of the week. As you pray, um, prayers of, of your own um, concerns, um, please do use those uh, to bring other concerns to God as well. So we encourage you to do that. Um, just to maybe highlight one or two of the announcements um, uh, so that you are aware of what's going on. Uh, we have a service this evening at 7 o'clock here in the church building. Uh, again, it's on a harvest theme and uh, John McCandless, our community evangelist, uh, will be leading that service. I want to encourage you to stay for a cup of tea afterwards. It'll be outside today since the weather is good. And if you've got 10 minutes at the end of the service, just to, to stay, remain, chat to one another outside, um, that would be good just to catch up and to encourage the sense of fellowship. Sense of fellowship is something that we have really, I suppose, missed over these last 18 months. Um, certainly it was something that I missed. And it's going to be a long way back for us, um, not only for us as a congregation, but for many churches and for many people in different walks of life. And so I would encourage you, if you can, um, to, to spend just five or ten minutes at the uh, outside at the front afterwards and spread out along the front so that we're not too close as we do that. Um, a couple of things. There's been an announcement on the uh, bulletin for the last number of weeks about discipleship groups. We hope to start these on Wednesday the 3rd of November at 7.30 p.m. Uh, we will meet first here in the church building and then break out into small groups in various rooms around the building. Um, that will then continue on the first and third Wednesdays of each month and in between that will be the church prayer time. Now, if you're still unable to join us um, on a Wednesday night here as we meet in person, um, you can join a Zoom group. Uh, there are about four places left for that. And that's aimed at people who, for one reason or another, are still shielding. They're still unable to join because of some health issue. Or if you've got kids at home and you can't leave them, obviously, uh, to fend for themselves because they're in bed. So we encourage you uh, to join in that way. We'll study exactly the same things so that we're all on the same page. Uh, the other announcements are there, and they're all important, but I do encourage you to read those as well. Now, I want to thank uh, Craig and uh, Phil and Tim up there, I suppose, as well today, uh, because I've been putting them to work with videos and all the rest of it. We saw earlier a video produced by our church um, that deals with climate change. Now, if you want to go onto the we church website, the Presbyterian Church website, uh, and put in Climate Sunday, it will bring up those resources. There's a longer video that you can watch about climate change and what the church is doing. Uh, and so we'd encourage you to do that. If you're on the internet, just type in Presbyterian Church in Ireland. It will take you to the website. And then if you put in on the search facility, on the church website, Climate Sunday, there's a link then to this page. Now, before we pray, and we're going to pick up some of the points um, that uh, were raised in the last video, and before we do that, um, what do you do? This is a, it's a song, but along with this song as a visual, there is a video which points us to the wonder of creation. And it is called, it's entitled, creation calls. So we're going to watch that just now.
I don't know whether it's because I'm getting old and foolish, um, but I always find that a very emotional video to watch. 
it shows us the vast array of life on this planet. The beauty that God put into our home in space. And that's what we've set about destroying. Not intentionally, but because of our greed. And those are the things that we need to bear in mind as we pray. That even though it's just a small thing, even though it might be just recycling aluminium cans or bottles or plastic packaging or cutting down in plastic packaging, these are things that we can do to help. And every little bit does help. So as we um, think about God's goodness and think about the beauty of the world he has created and the vast array of life, Let's pray together. Our God and our Father, we thank you today for the creation that you made, for this world and this universe and all its vast array, for all the forms of life that we see on earth, for the beauty that confronts us day by day and that greater beauty perhaps in different parts of the world that we've seen on this video today. We thank you, O God, for the beauty and the fruitfulness of the earth. We praise you, O God, that the earth produces what we need as we cultivate it and till the soil, as farmers uh, and people across the world produce food. It is the earth that is fruitful because that's how you planned it and that's how you put it together. And we give you thanks, O God, for the gift of this world that you have given to us as our home for the good that is in it. And Father, you have asked as you have commanded us to enjoy this earth, to fill it and subdue it, but also to be stewards of it. And we remember today that we are stewards of the earth, that you have given to us this responsibility. We are not to abuse the earth, we are not to exploit it. And Father, we pray today that we would remember that charge that you have given to us. We want to confess, O oh God, that we have been careless, and that we have been thoughtless, and we have exploited the earth in a way that we ought not to have done. We confess today, O oh God, that our management as a human race of the earth's resources has not been what it should be. And that's particularly the case now that we understand the effects of human life and human activity on the climate and the earth in general. Father, in a previous day, perhaps when we did not understand these things, that was excusable. But Lord, we are without excuse today. So help us, we pray, to think what we individually can do to protect the earth and to protect the environment. Lord, we do pray for this COP26 conference coming up. We pray for leaders of the world, uh, those in political power, that they would engage with this conference and that there would be within their hearts and within their government's agenda a desire to change. We pray for a real commitment to action, not just so that they are seen to be doing the right thing, but that they actually do the right thing. And we pray particularly for the wealthy nations of the world, that they would show that leadership, that there would be within their consideration a concern for the poor and the poor nations of the world that are largely affected by climate change through drought and flooding and all the rest that we see on our television. And we pray for ourselves. We pray, O oh God, that we might have that concern for the environment that we would be motivated in our hearts to take those small steps that will help and that we will continue to pray not only for the well-being of the earth in which we live but also for the poor of the earth and that we would see our responsibility to care for all the people of the world. And we pray these things in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Well, folks, uh, Ken read earlier the passage from John chapter 4 uh, that we're going to look at today. And uh, this chapter, or this, this section of the reading, 
comes after uh, the account of Jesus meeting with the woman at the well. I suppose harvests and the environment have been very much to the forefront of our thought today, right throughout the service, as we give God thanks for the harvest and we think about the environment and we think and give thanks for, think about and give thanks for the world he has given us. So the focus of our thanksgiving has been the environment, the world, the harvest, and God who is the center of our praise because he is the one who has given the gift of the earth but also the harvest that we enjoy. Now, when it comes to this passage in John 4, I have to say that I never particularly noticed it before, but the whole context of this event that is described by John, this meeting, this conversation with the woman, and later then with the disciples, even the conversion of the people in the city or the town of Sychar is within that overall context of the harvest and what comes from the life-giving bread. Now, it's true, of course, that in his conversation with the woman at the well, water is the focus. This living water that Jesus can give is the focus of that conversation. But we need to remember as well that the reason that Jesus is at the well is that his disciples have gone into town to buy food. They'd gone into the town to get food. And that's why Jesus is at the well. He's tired. They've gone on. He is resting there. And the woman comes to get water. And the conversation with the disciples after the woman returns to the town, the focus of our study today came about because of their insistence that Jesus would eat something, that he would partake of some food. So between the water of life on the one hand and the food of doing the Father's will and reaping a spiritual harvest on the other, it is clear that there are important lessons for us here as a church and as those who follow and trust Jesus Christ. And that then is the context of this uh, um, conversation Jesus has with the disciples. But it is that context that leads us to think about the prejudice and the priorities of believers. What are our prejudices? What are our priorities as those who trust Jesus Christ? And, of course, to the contrast and the attitude of Jesus and his disciples, because there is a contrast here between what Jesus says and what the disciples have done. And from there, we need to reflect upon our own expectations. What are our own expectations of a spiritual harvest in these days? Is this something that only happened then when Jesus walked about Galilee and Judea? Or is it something that we can expect today? And although the unspoken questions here of the disciples when they come back from the town, presumably with food, because they urge Jesus to eat, those unspoken questions Um, of the disciples that are are voiced by John in verse 27 reveal the common attitudes of, I suppose, men of the day to women and of Jews towards Samaritans. Now, the disciples shouldn't really have been surprised that Jesus was talking to a woman and a Samaritan that he was doing both of these things because it was like a double whammy, if you want. She wasn't only a woman, she was also a Samaritan because he had the reputation for doing that sort of thing. It was one of the things that he was criticized for. You're talking to them, you're associating with sinners, you're going to the house of publicans, tax collectors. But perhaps it's their secret thoughts and the apparent failure to take the opportunity in the town of Sychar to evangelize the people there when they were just simply going about their business that brings this to light. And it's that that shows the element of prejudice. And certainly I think there's a cultural prejudice here because Jews and Samaritans, as we're told in verse 9 of chapter 4, do not associate. Jews do not associate with Samaritans. And so maybe there is immediately here an absence of concern for the Samaritan people, even an expectation um, that they would not respond to the gospel. Perhaps there is a spiritual aloofness. We are the people. We are the people who have got it right. 
not you, not you Samaritans. The gospel is not for such people. Now, that's certainly not the case with Jesus. Here we find a completely different attitude. Now, what is the tension between the Jews and the Samaritans? What has caused this rivalry between these two people? Well, in some senses, it was like a family feud. It was a kind of a family feud. And like all family fallouts, sometimes it leads to intense and bitter argument. Samaria was the capital of the old northern kingdom of Israel. Those ten tribes that broke away after David's reign and Solomon's reign, then the kingdom split into the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. And it was the southern kingdom of Judah that remained loyal to David's house. So Samaria then became the capital of the northern tribes, the ten tribes that broke away from David's house. And they set up there in Samaria a rival center of worship. But after the Assyrian invasion, I'm sorry to bore you with all these details, but after the the Assyrian invasion, um, that great, I suppose, superpower of the day that invaded and took captive uh, the northern tribes, the uh, tribes of Israel, the Samaritans became a, a people of mixed ethnicity because the Assyrians took people out of Israel and they brought different people into Israel. And so with these people coming in, they brought their own worship, they brought their own gods, and that alloyed, it polluted in a sense, the worship of Israel, which was already going uh, wrong in any case. So what is, who are the Samaritans now? They're people of a mixed population. And the result was, of course, that um, the worship of Israel's God was corrupted by the worship of pagan idols. So there was a difference immediately between these people. Um, There's a difference of attitude between the disciples and the Samaritans, the Jews and the Samaritans. And there is a difference of opinion, or not not opinion, of approach and attitude between Jesus and his disciples. There is also a difference in their priorities that we encounter here. The disciples had gone into town to buy food. And along with that, it seems in verse 38, from what Jesus said, he had sent them to reap a harvest. Now, we don't know what that meant. No one is clear. Um, We don't know of the conversation that took place before the disciples uh, went off to the town to to buy food. We don't know whether it was general a command to reap wherever they went, to sow the seeds of the gospel, to reap a harvest wherever they went, or whether it was specific to this occasion so that whenever they went into town to buy food, Jesus said to them, make sure you tell people about me. Make sure you share the gospel. We don't know what that conversation was. But we can also almost, I suppose, sense the disappointment in Jesus' voice as he responds to their urging to eat food. Now, a high priority for them was that they would have a meal, that uh, taking care of their immediate needs was a high priority for the disciples. But for Jesus, even though he needed to eat, even though he needed to have a meal, his priority was to do the Father's will. And his statement here reminds us of the temptation. Do you remember that he faced in the desert when he was uh, baptized in the River Jordan? We we thought about this just a few weeks ago. He was driven by the Spirit into the desert, and there he was tempted by the devil. And the first thing was, after he had uh, not eaten for 40 days and 40 nights, the temptation was, turn the stones into bread. And how did he answer that? By quoting Scripture in answer to that temptation. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. If the Samaritans, like all people, were to have eternal life, if they were to know God's rescue, God's salvation, then that word of God, which brings life, must be shared with them. And that could only happen 
That could only happen on this occasion when they relegated their prejudices and realigned their priorities so that they could do that work. And it's exactly the same today. There is a cost to the church of sharing the gospel. And that cost is that, well, the cost is we should never have prejudices in the first place. So we hunt those out and we set them aside. But we also realign our priorities. So it requires, in a sense, the church to go on a missionary footing. Like in a time of war, before the Second World War, Britain went on to a war footing. Every member of the country had a part to play, whether it was working in factories, the shipyard down the road, the farmers producing food, the men who went to war, the ladies, women who stayed at home, uh, the women who joined um, the forces here um, so that they manned the airfields and uh, drove buses and all the rest of it. The whole country went on a war footing. Well, today, the church needs to go on a missionary footing. We need to have a new mindset that has sharing this good news as second nature for us. Now, the irony here is that it's the woman, the Samaritan woman, the woman who does both of these things. She leaves the very thing that she'd come out to get a jar of water. She leaves it there and she goes back into the town as she scurries off there to share in a very natural way the good news that she has learned. Come and meet a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? Now the same challenge faces us. It is a challenge to our attitudes as Christians, to people that we may have issues with, whatever those issues may be, whether they're personal disagreements, whether they are matters of faith and doctrine, whether they are historical, national, or political. These lesser things for Christians often create barriers to mission. Because of a political view, we cannot talk to someone. Because of a personal disagreement, we dare not say anything. But we need that change of mindset as believers today. If the church in the West is to grow, if the church in our land is to grow, if the good news is to be heard again in an island that we think is so religious, but really isn't, then we need a change of mindset. And there is also a challenge here to our priorities as a church, I think, and indeed to us as individuals as well. The reality is, you see, that we are often preoccupied with our own immediate needs and these are the things that we think of first and foremost. And we are often consumed with our own interests and our own pleasures more than we are with sharing this good news. The thing that preoccupied the disciples at this point, it wasn't something bad. It wasn't something that they didn't need. It was ordinary and it was necessary. But right then, right at that point in time, it distracted them from the higher calling that Christ had given them to go and to reap a harvest. And you know, it can be exactly the same for us. It can be exactly the same. As they entered uh, at that age um, that we still live in, an age that we call the last days, theologically the last days, the time between Christ's coming and Christ's return. And in that time, foretold by Amos in Amos 9, 13, that the sowing and the reaping for the kingdom of God would happen at the same time. Now, for Israel, in a sense, that was um, fulfilled in national blessing. But the prophecy points beyond Israel for its fulfillment in a spiritual blessing. Now, that's the age that we live in. That's the day that we live in. So what are we doing? Are we reaping as we were told to reap? Is the church active in the gospel as it should be? Or are we content to sit and talk about other things, things that interest us, things that are good, things that are important? 
Now, we have been given that, that task by God, by Christ, of gathering people into his kingdom. And the promise of God is that there will be a harvest and it will be reaped. And here is an example of it, right in this story, right here. An example of a harvest in an unexpected place. And to be honest, in an, an, in an unpromising place as well, city of Sychar. Now, Jesus' disciples had just come back from the town. And I wonder when they were there, had they done what Jesus said? Did they speak about Jesus? And did they stop doing it because they found it discouraging? Because they found the atmosphere of the place challenging? And so the mission about Jesus was set, quietly set aside. He had sent them to reap in Sychar, in Samaria, as much as they did in Galilee. And now there's an illustration of what he meant, um, an illustration of his meaning was about to fall on them. Now you can imagine the scene, I hope, it's Jesus talking to his disciples about, um, you know, I sent you to reap and all the rest of it. And, you know, this conversation has been going on, but the whole time this conversation is developing, their harvest of souls has begun. And converging on them is the population of the town coming out to meet Jesus, coming out to see him because of what the woman has said. They are inspired by the woman's testimony and many believed and many would come to believe because Jesus stayed two more days with them. Now you see, Jesus' words here have an urgency and they still have that urgency and still have that relevance for the church today. They meant something to the disciples then. I sent you to reap a harvest. But they didn't do it. But those words, that command, that commission to the church today still has a relevance. We are to do the same. And here is a harvest in unexpected places. And that's a challenge to us. Because sometimes our expectation is so low. There is a challenge here which poses a number of questions. First of all, what? As individual Christians and as a church, as we read this, what are our concerns? What are the things that concern us today? The truth is, you see, that we can forget our calling very easily. We can forget the purpose of the church so that it simply becomes a social club that we can belong to. And that's, that serves a purpose, that's good. We meet other people, we have a good time with them and all the rest of it. But that's not the purpose of the church. It's a secondary thing, that. We can be consumed by these lesser things, things that are passing, that in eternity have no value, really. Some things, on the other hand, that are good can also um, possess our souls, take up our attention. They're good in their place, um, or they have been good things to practice. But if our attention is fixed only on things like buildings and traditions that are necessary and may be good, if these things take our attention from the work of sowing and reaping for the kingdom, if we as a church lose our desire to reach out to others because they are a bit different, because they're not the same, because they may upset things for us, or we just can't imagine a spiritual harvest among those people or that person coming to faith in the workplace or those people within the community that we live in. If we can't imagine that, then how will we be motivated to reach out? And if that's the case, then how do we answer Jesus? when he says to us, I sent you to reap a harvest. Now, if Sychar was an unpromising place, and yet we see a great harvest there, and Jesus, after all, stayed two days, as I said a moment ago, whereas in other places he was chased away, places in Israel he was chased out of town, run out like a criminal. 
John indeed tells us then that many people believed. Now could we, if we had a small amount of faith or even with unself, unself-conscious joy that the Samaritan woman showed, could we not do the same thing? Because the Lord has not changed. Second question is, who have we limited the gospel to? Now we don't know if the disciples simply didn't expect the people of Sychar to respond or to believe in Jesus or whether they decided that this wasn't the place and these weren't the people to hear this message of salvation. Whatever it was, events proved them wrong because they were exactly the people to hear this message of salvation. You see, very often we want people like us to come into the church. People just the same as us. Those are the people that we can get on with. Those are the people that we can live with. We don't want people who have different views. We don't want people to challenge what we're doing. We don't want people who are too enthusiastic. People who have a different social standing, well, maybe they're not welcome either. People who look and act differently or perhaps have baggage, a past, that still affects their present because that's going to be too time-consuming to spend time with those people. But we need to remember that, you know, these are, these are days of change in our community. Belfast is changing. Our city is changing. The world is a smaller place. Time out of number, people have more social problems. But that doesn't matter. None of it matters. The mission is still the same. It hasn't changed. We are still to share the love of Jesus Christ. We are still as a church to tell the good news to invite people to meet Jesus. Now, it's not in our power to provide the harvest. We can't convert people, but we can share with them. And God's work, the Holy Spirit's work, is to change the heart. And the last question, and you'll be glad I'm sure of this, the last question, when is the right time? When is the right time? Now, in a sense, it's very easy to answer that question. If this is the ongoing mission of the church that we're talking about. So if it's an ongoing mission, then exactly now is the right time to share these things. This is the right time. Now, why do I say that? Because we sometimes say, or at least think, that this isn't the right time, and this is not the best time. There are other things that we need to do, other things that we need to give our time and attention to, so this isn't the right time. And it's the equivalent of what the Jews were saying. The saying in Israel at the time, it's still four months to harvest. When all along, for Jesus, as he looked out, he could see that the fields were ripe for harvest and indeed that the reapers were already working in the field. Now, you know, this is not only a challenge to me, it's a challenge to us all. You know, we may be a bit afraid to speak for Jesus. We may be a bit uncertain and lacking in confidence. It's not something that we've been used to doing before. Because in our day, nearly everybody had some connection with the church. Perhaps the look of people puts us off. Perhaps the expectation of being rejected puts us off. Maybe it's fear, that simple fear that they might not be interested in what we're talking about and shun us. Or they would change their opinion of us. Or maybe it's just that we haven't tried. Even a little. But if we did try just a little, maybe we would find out that what Jesus actually says is true. That there is there a harvest to be reaped. The fields are already ripe for harvest and that people most people anyway are actually willing to listen to what we have to say now, in any event the call is not ours whether the time is right or not Jesus says this is the time he sends us the commission from Jesus leaves us no room for debate we can't argue with him he sent the disciples to reap and in a very real sense, that is still 
the commission of the church. We are sent to reap. This woman had only encountered Jesus, but her conviction and her urgency and the joy with which she communicated that message drew others out to meet him and drew others to Jesus. And so as we close today, there's been a lot of challenge in this for you and for me, but I want to encourage you today. We can think this is difficult. Our priorities might be wrong in some respects. We may say to ourselves and to one another, the time's not right. I'm too young. I'm too old. I have nothing in common with them. I, I'm no good at that sort of thing. You need to be gifted for that sort of thing. And yet that's not what Jesus says. We are sent to be witnesses, and witnesses simply tell what they've seen, what they've heard, what they've experienced. And that's all that's required. That's all that he requires of us. And faith and obedience and honesty and a wee bit of courage in telling what Jesus has done for us. No big programs are necessary. No great schemes of evangelism in the way I suppose we thought they were necessary in the past. But I still think that communities and hearts are changed one by one as people meet Jesus and trust in him. And harvests are still won in unexpected places. And our God can still surprise us by his grace. Let's pray together. Father, we pray that you would put in our hearts the desire to reach out to others, to share with them the good news of Jesus Christ. Sometimes our fears are genuine. Sometimes we feel awkward and ill-prepared. And those feelings are genuine. Lord, we pray that we might motivate ourselves to be prepared, that you would put courage in our hearts, that you would give us the gift of faith, and that you would put the words in our mouth that we need to speak. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're going to sing our concluding hymn, Jesus is Lord, the cry that echoes through creation.
as we close, let's say the grace to one another as we bless each other. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all, now and forevermore. Amen.